Hello there! I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so... Uh, this is Dr. Byrup, and uh, obviously, I am not on campus. Uh, my children said to me, Dad, why can't we have a snow day? And I got thinking about it, and I said, you know what? I'm a professor. If I want to have a snow day, I'll have a snow day. And so I decided we'd have a snow day. Um, the truth of the matter is it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, my children, well, one of my children is in the midst of figuring out where she's going to go to college. And uh, my wife and I are uh, juggling where we take her and when. And by chance, uh, the lot fell upon me. And so uh, instead of being in class, I am actually uh, in the state of Alabama uh, at an unnamed school uh, in the SEC whose colors are red and, uh, and white and known for their football. And uh, anyway, that's where I am uh, visiting at the moment. Uh, but I didn't want you to miss out on uh, a lecture. And uh, to that end, I'm, uh, I put together this video uh, to allow you to really pick up where we left off last time. And uh, by, way to, by way of reminder, uh, that was with the death of Getulio Vargas uh, in, the, in uh, 1954. More specifically, the suicide of Getulio Vargas on August the 23rd, 1954. And uh, for today's class, we are really going to pick up in the wake of Vargas's suicide and, and really move forward uh, from there. Uh, to this end, we will be talking really about the story, uh, the stories, I should say, of three Brazilian presidents that follow in Vargas's wake. Uh, by chance, all of their names begin with a J. Uh, we'll talk today about Juscelino Kubitschek, Janio Quadros, and João Goulart. Uh, who's more commonly known, actually, by the nickname of Jango. Uh, so, the story today, Juscelino, Janio, and Jango. Uh, but to tell that story, I really need to give you uh, a sense of the terms, the material that we're going to be covering in today's lecture. And to that end, I want to take a moment, uh, put up on the screen uh, the terms that I would have otherwise put up uh, on the chalkboard. And so, uh, let me show you those terms. Uh, we'll jump right in there the wake of Vargas's suicide. All right, uh, here is a, a list of terms uh, for you to just take down your notes. Uh, some of these we're gonna spend a great deal more time on than others. And I've thrown in a few things at the beginning that also reflect earlier uh, material. You'll see here at the beginning, Getulio Vargas and Carlos Lacerda that we talked about last time. Uh, really moving from here, from João Café Filho uh, forward, is the material that we're going to cover right now. And uh, in terms of this, I would suggest that you push the pause button for a moment uh, to get all of these things down. And then from there, uh, you know, push play and uh, you can hear the rest of the lecture. And we are back. Uh, and I want to begin again, as I said, in the wake of Vargas's suicide, again, August the 23rd, 1954, Getulio Vargas, late into the night, pulls out a revolver, a Colt, puts it to his chest, and pulls the trigger. Nothing would be the same thereafter. Uh, you'll recall, the Brazilian military had been on the verge of a coup uh, to drive Vargas from power. With this suicide, Vargas completely turns the tables. Uh, and in lieu of being driven from power, he's out of power, of course, he is able to stop, essentially, this military coup uh, from uh, occurring. Uh, thereafter, uh, his, his vice president, a man, a man by the name of João Café Filho, will assume the presidency of Brazil. Uh, in the wake of this as well, of course, people take to the streets in large numbers. Uh, Carlos Lacerda, who uh, 
who in many ways had precipitated Vargas' suicide after he himself had nearly been assassinated uh, in, in a, a conspiracy that had very much been linked back uh, to Vargas, to Vargas's people, Carlos Lacerda is forced to flee the country. Uh, the army and uh, the UDN, one uh, the traditional party that was in opposition to Vargas prior to this, the army and the UDN were no longer in a position to implement a coup that, it, they, that really had been in the planning stages. Uh, as I said, João Café Filho, Vargas's vice president, will thereafter assume the presidency. Uh, he will assure the country uh, that a presidential election is going to be held. Uh, and so in the wake of Vargas' suicide, what you have, among other things, is different people and powers and parties jockeying for power, preparing for an election. And the election was going to be held in October 1955. Uh, in terms of that presidential election, the October 1955 presidential election, again, you've got different people and parties jockeying for power. Uh, in February of 1955, the PSD will nominate Juscelino Kubitschek to be its presidential candidate. Uh, the PSD, again, was one of the traditional parties that had been created during Vargas' time in power, uh, really with Vargas's blessing, uh, a patron, as it were, to this, among other parties. Uh, Kubitschek, in terms of some quick background, was a governor at this point in time. He was the governor of the Brazilian state, of Minas Gerais, very powerful, very important state. Uh, we've talked about it before. In terms of some quick background on Kubitschek, uh, he was born in 1902. He'd eventually die actually in 1976, uh, but he will go on to be an important figure in Brazilian politics uh, in the midst of all of this. And again, he begins to run in uh, February, well, I say he gets the nomination in February of 1955. Uh, he will subsequently gain support of elements within the PTB. And again, the PTB was the Workers' Party. Uh, it was a leftist party that also had been created uh, by Vargas with his blessing during Vargas's time in power. And in terms of gaining support of elements uh, with, from within the PTB, essentially he will run for the presidency on a ticket with a vice presidential candidate uh, who is a member of the PTB. And that vice presidential candidate was João Goulart. Uh, and we'll talk more about João Goulart going forward, but in terms of some just quick background, he's born in 1918. He is a gaucho. Uh, he is from Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, he was fairly wealthy, uh, owned lots and lots of land, cattle ranches essentially, huge, huge cattle estate. Uh, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, Goulart had traditionally been associated uh, with this workers' party and with labor unions uh, in Brazil. Drew, drew a lot of support from labor unions. Uh, for a period of time towards the end of Vargas's presidency, uh, prior to the suicide, uh, Goulart had actually uh, been uh, the minister of labor uh, for uh, Getulio Vargas. And Vargas and Goulart uh, both come from the same state, uh, Rio Grande do Sul. They were both gauchos uh, in this regard. Uh, gaucho is just a term uh, that is used to refer to somebody in Brazil from the Brazilian state of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, after Vargas' suicide, uh, many felt that the mantle of his presidency had fallen upon this labor minister. Uh, João Goulart. Uh, but at this point in time, Goulart is running not for the presidency, but for the vice presidency, but running as a ticket, really, uh, with the PSD uh, candidate, Juscelino Kubitschek, who was running for the presidency. Uh, in terms of other parties and peoples and so on, various other peoples, again, are jockeying for power. Uh, the UDN, traditional opposition party to Getulio Vargas, will nominate a man named Juarez Tavara, uh, Juarez Tavara, I should say, who is an old member of the Tenenshi movement. Uh, additionally, there are a variety of other candidates. Uh, Plinio Salgado of the Integralists has come back to Brazil. Uh, he's running for the presidency uh, as well. Uh, ultimately, Kubitschek will win the election with 36% of the vote, and Goulart will be elected vice president 
by an even greater margin. A uh, point I should make here. Although Kubitschek and Gallard are essentially campaigning as a ticket, uh, the electoral laws at this time required separate votes for each office. Uh, and in this regard, people went to the polls, they voted for a president, and simultaneously they voted for a vice president. Uh, these two that ran as a ticket didn't necessarily have to win together, given these electoral laws, but they do. Uh, this being said, after Kubitschek and Gallart's victory, a campaign actually will begin uh, to keep them out of office, and it is precipitated by a crisis. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail in terms of this campaign. Ultimately, Kubitschek will become president, Gallart will become vice president, but in terms of just some quick background here. November 1955, the election has been held, the new people have not yet assumed office, the current president, Vargas's old vice presidential candidate, the Juan Café Filho, will have a heart attack. And on account of his heart attack, he will be forced to temporarily relinquish power to a man named Carlos Luz uh, of the UDN, who was president of the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies and was in line uh, to basically assume the responsibilities of the presidency if the current president, the Juan Café Filho, who had been a vice president again, uh, were to uh, be forced to relinquish his powers. Luz is in the midst of all of this, assuming control, and is accused of openly favoring a military coup to keep himself in power, to keep Kubitschek and Golart uh, out of power. Uh, anyway, in the midst of all of this, various sectors of the military will be mobilized. Uh, ultimately, one member of the military, a, a man named uh, Enhiki Lot, will actually force Luz to flee with all of his ministers aboard a Navy ship. Uh, Luz will try to organize resistance from the sea, but he will be unsuccessful. Uh, anyway, the military that was thought was going to keep Luz in power ultimately uh, forces him to leave. Uh, Congress thereafter will judge him to be out of office. He's uh, out on the sea somewhere, and they will declare the Senate president to be yet another provisional uh, president. Uh, by now, Juan Café Filho, the vice president of Vargas, who'd assumed the presidency, he's better, but Congress doesn't allow him to reassume uh, the authority of the presidency. Instead, Congress will enact various states of siege uh, until Kubitschek and Gallart will finally be inaugurated on January the 31st, 1956. Uh, anyway, point to be made here simply uh, is that, uh, yeah, there's an election held. It's promised to be held. It is held, uh, but it is not without incident, uh, even though these two characters, uh, Juscelino and Jango, will assume the presidency and the vice presidency respectively. Again, January the 31st. 1956. Uh, just to give you a sense of these characters, I want to uh, just take a moment, we'll come right back to the lecture, but let me just show you an image. You can get a sense of Juscelino Kubitschek, you can get a sense of what, as well of, uh, of Django Gollart. And uh, as promised, uh, here is an image, a picture of Juscelino Kubitschek, who was elected uh, to the presidency of Brazil in October 1955. Again, he ran on a ticket uh, with a member of a different party. And this is João Goulart, who had previously uh, been the labor minister for a period of time to Getúlio Vargas. Uh, here's just an image really quickly showing you the two of them together. This was shortly after their uh, winning the presidency. Uh, who do you see in the background? Let me just highlight this here very quickly. If you look in the background right here, this is Getúlio Vargas. Uh, he's gone but not really. His legacy, uh, in many ways, as you can see, is very much living on. So we are back. Uh, Juscelino Kubitschek. Let's talk about his presidency. Uh, to begin with, Kubitschek was an extremely popular uh, president. Uh, the emphasis in terms of his administration uh, was not on what you would necessarily call a kind of economic nationalism, per se, but rather on uh, economic development uh, and order. Uh, the motto of his administration was 50 years in five. Uh, he wanted to see Brazil progress in all sorts of ways. Uh, his emphasis on development and order eventually would garner him the support of elements in the Brazilian military uh, who had been at least partially against 
uh, him coming to power. Uh, this Carlos Luz that I told you about before that had uh, tried to prevent uh, Kubitschek from assuming the presidency, he'd been the president of the Brazilian Chamber of Deputies. Uh, elements of the military had helped him flee when other elements were forcing him out. Ultimately, Kubitschek wins over the elements that had been in support of this Carlos Luz, uh, that had been worried about Kubitschek and uh, this Golart uh, coming uh, to power. Uh, in terms of really winning over the military, uh, Kubitschek uh, was helped by the fact that he makes a highly respected uh, and really nonpartisan general his minister of war. And this was this Enhiki Lot that I mentioned before who had uh, said, we're going to keep with these elections you know, wouldn't allow this Carlos Luz to precipitate a military coup. So anyway, uh, the Minister of War becomes this very man in Hiki Lot. Uh, additionally, Kubitschek will mo mollify the military, I should note, uh, by making large weapons uh, purchases. Uh, anyway, the fact that he'd garnered the support of both the PSD and the PTB meant that his reforms would uh, really be enabled to be enacted in Congress. Uh, and amazingly, over the course of his administration, he was able to maintain the support of both of these two, uh, really you could say very different constituencies. Uh, in terms of his PSD support, and again, he was the PSD nominee for the presidency, but his PSD support would come from sectors of the rural elite, uh, from really middle-of-the-road government bureaucrats who had come to power uh, under the administration of Getulio Vargas during the Estado Novo. Uh, and also he, he drew on support in terms of the PSD from the part of the industrial and commercial elite who benefited from his policies of economic uh, development. Uh, of course, he's garnering support than more than just the PSD. Uh, he has the support of the Workers' Party as well, uh, the PTB. And, and this support would come from leftists uh, who had, with the passage of time, by the time you get to the 1950s at least, who had come to support Getulio Vargas, uh, including uh, the union and ministries of uh, labor uh, bureaucracies. Uh, the industrial elite also support him who were more inclined to notions of economic nationalism, and the majority of urban union workers uh, would support the PTB and had come to support him as well. So anyway, he's really able to kind of cobble together support from different elements uh, within the, the Brazilian body politic, uh, as it were. Uh, in terms of his economic policies, and again, he's very much about development uh, and so on, he would create a target program. In Portuguese, it was called uh, the Programa de Metas, a, a program of goals, uh, if you will. And these would consist of 31 objectives spread over really several large areas. Uh, energy, transportation, uh, basic industry, education, uh, and ultimately the construction of the new capital of Brasilia. Uh, that we're going to talk about in greater detail uh, in a moment here. Uh, the construction of Brasilia ultimately was supposed to, to as it were, uh, be the synthesis of everything uh, else. That is to say, energy, transportation, industry, education, uh, all of this kind of comes together in the construction of a new capital for Brazil. Uh, before we talk about that capital, just a couple of other points very, very quickly. Uh, he ultimately would create various new parallel bureaucracies that were supposed to make it so that you could circumvent uh, the inefficient and corrupt bureaucracies that were already in existence. A uh, quick example of this. Uh, he creates a new body. It is called in Portuguese Sudeni. Uh, and I'll spell it out for you here so you can see it. But this stands for the Superintendência do Desenvolvimento do Nordeste. The Nordeste is the Northeast. It's a new body responsible for developing the Northeast of Brazil. Uh, it is intended to take the place of an old body uh, that was referred to as DNOX, the Departamento de Obras Contra Secas. Uh, it's supposed to spur development uh, in the North. Uh, the reality, he doesn't really do away with the old body, the old bureaucracy. It's still there. It's still in existence. He just creates a new one, as it were, uh, that's going to be loyal to him uh, and that he's hoping to get things done with. Uh, it doesn't really simplify anything at all. If anything, it reminds me uh, of things hundreds of years before. You recall we, we talked in the mid-18th century 
about the creation of uh, ministries that were supposed to uh, be making things run more efficiently uh, because the old colonial, old other conciliar bodies, councils, were considered to be inefficient. Uh, what do you do? You add a new level to the bureaucracy. Uh, Jusselin Kubitschek, he's doing the same thing. It's a time-honored sort of uh, thing, I suppose, among bureaucrats. Uh, although his administration practiced a great deal of state intervention in the economy, it also very much sought to provide incentives for foreign investment, for foreign capital to make its way into Brazil. Uh, and in terms of this, during his administration, uh, economic nationalism, you could argue, lost ground to what might be termed developmentalism. Uh, let's pour money in. Uh, we don't need to nationalize the economy, as it were. We need capital, even if it's foreign capital coming in. Uh, under Kubitschek, foreign investment would receive major incentives in such areas as the automotive industry, uh, air transport, railways, uh, electricity would be uh, another example as well. Uh, let me really quickly just give you a sense of economic growth under Kubitschek. Uh, between 1955 and 1961, revenue from industrial production would increase by 80%. Uh, and production of all sorts of other things would skyrocket during the same period of time as well. Uh, let me just give you a sense of that. Steel production would increase in Brazil by 100% between the years 1955 and 1961. Uh, the production of machinery would increase by 125%. Uh, electricity and communications by 380%. Uh, the production of transportation material would increase by 600%. Uh, Brazil's GDP, its gross domestic product, would grow at a yearly rate of 7%. And per capita, uh, this was approximately three times as much as the rest of Latin America. Uh, anyway, Brazil will economically, developmentally, you could say, be transformed during this period of time. Uh, Kubitschek's greatest progress, pro project uh, was something that I referred to earlier, the construction of a new capital for Brazil, uh, the capital of Brasilia. Uh, the futuristic Brasilia, it was very much conceived of in futuristic terms, was built from scratch on a completely undeveloped plateau 600 miles into the interior. Uh, in terms of building this thing, what do you do? How do you do it? Well, ultimately, they hold a contest. The contest would be, hold, would be held for how the city should be designed. What should it look like? Uh, the contest will be won by a man named Lucio Costa, uh, who would propose what he called a pilot plan. Uh, what does the pilot plan consist of? From the air, the city that is going to be built is going to look like a giant airplane. Uh, what does an airplane look like? If I had the, the chalkboard here, I'd show you. But And I'll show you a, a bit here in a moment what it looks like in terms of just a schematic representation. But essentially, airplane, you've got this front part where the pilot sits. You've got the wings that go out like that. Uh, you've got this fuselage going down here. That is what the city uh, is built from the air uh, to look like. Again, it's called the pilot plan, the pa plano piloto in Portuguese. Uh, construction would begin in 1956. Uh, many of the buildings would be designed by the famed Brazilian ar architect Oscar Niemeyer, who was intent on creating a very modernist sort of city. Uh, in terms of these notions of modernism and you know progress and development and so forth, uh, housing, shops, banking, uh, embassies, etc., would all be organized in gigantic blocks. Uh, and so, in terms of the organization of these blocks, as it were, you'd have all the churches in one place. You'd have the supermarkets in one place. You'd have the banks in one place over here, government ministries here. Anyway, everything was organized in the most minute detail and just building out, uh, as it were, with a sense of order organization, modernism in all sorts of ways. Uh, in terms of modernism, streets were uh, supposed to go over and under one another so that there would be no traffic lights. And you go to Brasilia today, you're going to see this. Uh, roads going over and under and uh, so on. Uh, the reality is 
in terms of modern Brasilia, a lot of this has been abandoned. You will find traffic lights uh, in Brasilia today. Uh, workers will be brought in from all over Brazil, particularly from poor areas in the Northeast. Uh, they would live in satellite cities during construction. Uh, I say satellite cities. Uh, essentially, a satellite city was, uh, you know, initially a squatter settlement on the outside of town, outside of the Plano Piloto, uh, outside of this great airplane that's being laid out on the ground. And so there might be one over here. There might be another one over here. There might be one here, one here. There's squatter settlements and so on. Uh, they come to be, with the passage of time, cities in their own right. And again, today will be referred to as satellite cities. They're orbiting, as it were, the great airplane on the ground, the Plano uh, Piloto, uh, as it were. Uh, and again, squatter settlements with the passage of time will become uh, established cities in their own right. Uh, I used to live in one. Uh, Taguachinga was uh, ultimately one of these early satellite cities. Uh, anyway, Brasilia was a monumental undertaking, and with the rest of uh, Kubitschek's ambitious projects, it would contribute to a sense of both development and prosperity during his tenure. Uh, this all being said, by the end of Kubitschek's uh, term, uh, the construction of Brasilia, his other economic pro uh, projects, would lead to a number of economic problems uh, that would especially plague his predecessors. Uh, what do these problems include? Uh, well, among other things, high inflation, around 40% uh, annual inflation, a burgeoning budget deficit, mounting foreign debt that was increasingly becoming uh, impossible to repay. Uh, anyway, uh, all of this really contributes to a sense of progress in Brazil, but it does come with an economic cost. Uh, 1959 you have the election of another split ticket. Uh, Jânio Quadros uh, will be elected president of Brazil. Uh, he has the support, incidentally, of the UDN, this traditional opposition party to Vargas. It had been in opposition uh, previously to the PSD, to the PTB, uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, Jânio Quadros will win the election uh, with the support of the UDN. He's not necessarily their candidate per se, but uh, many of the members of the UDN support him. Uh, the vice president will again be João Goulart. The João Goulart that I, I referred to before, a uh, member of the PTB, the Brazilian Workers Party, he will be re-elected as vice president. Uh, unlike the case from four years before, when Kubitschek and Goulart had essentially run a, as a ticket, Jânio Quadros and João Goulart uh, are not running together as a ticket. Uh, this is just the way the election uh, panned out. Uh, in terms of this, it said they actually don't get along uh, necessarily at all. Uh, but let me give you some quick background uh, on Jânio Quadros. I'll show you a picture of the man here in a moment as well. Uh, his rise to power in Brazil is said to be nothing short of phenomenal. Uh, he'll begin his career as a school teacher in the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, later, he runs to be a member, an, an alderman, essentially a member of the city council. Uh, in 1953, he will become the city's mayor. Uh, the following year, he will be elected governor of the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, in 1958, he will win a seat in Brazil's Chamber of Deputies. And two years later, he will cap off his political career by handily winning the presidential election of 1960. Uh, by 1960, he's president. Ten years before, uh, you know, he's a school teacher uh, in Sao Paulo. I mean, his, his rise to power was just uh, just phenomenally medi meteoric. I don't know what the word would be. Uh, anyway, Quadros' appeal as a politician uh, came from the fact that he did not claim to be one. Rather, he fostered the image of what he called the anti-politician. That is to say, one who rose above political corruption. Uh, he claimed to hold political parties in contempt. He made plain that their support came with uh, no strings attached. Uh, he was blessed really with an overabundance of charisma and confidence. Uh, he was known for all sorts of unorthodox methods and uh, attitudes and so forth. Let me give you some examples of these. Uh, while he is president of Brazil, uh, he prohibits the wearing of bikinis on Rio's beaches 
Uh, he also prohibits the use of perfume bombs during carnival uh, because, among other things, he had been injured by one of these perfume bombs uh, as a boy. Uh, he had this habit, it said, of issuing numerous handwritten notes, little instructions, bilhetinhos, they would call them in Portuguese. And he'd, he'd, he'd send these forth every which way on a daily basis as if he was some sort of, you know, latter-day Napoleon. Here, you go do this, you go do that, you go do this, you go do that. Uh, he was renowned for his unkempt appearance, uh, his Charlie Chaplin-like mustache, and his thick rimmed glasses. And let me show you a picture of this guy, just to give you a sense and image of what we're talking about here. And again, this is Janio Quadros. And uh, as promised, just very quickly, here's an image of Janio Quadros. You can see his glasses, his mustache, uh, and so forth. Uh, he's blessed with just an overabundance of confidence and charisma. Here's another image of uh, uh, Janio Quadros here. Let me tell you uh, a bit more about the rest of his uh, time in power. In terms of uh, Quadros's presidency, he would be known, among other things, for pursuing a type of foreign policy that was very much considered independent, an independent foreign policy. During his campaign for the Brazilian presidency, Quadros made references to renewing diplomatic and trade relations with various socialist countries uh, in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, even the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, during the interim between his election and his inauguration, he actually made a world tour. He called it his world tour. It included stops in both Cuba and the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, and shortly after taking office, Quadros would send a delegation to the Soviet Union in April of 1961 and begin making preparations to establish full diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Uh, additionally, he would award Che Guevara uh, the Order of the Southern Cross. This was the highest award that Brazil could give a foreigner. Uh, in terms of all of this, Quadros's independence really worried. It angered U.S. policymakers who envisioned Brazil really at the center of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America during this era. And, uh, of course, U.S. foreign policy during this era was very much conceived of as being anti-communist. We're in the midst of the Cold War, and uh, this Janio Quadros seems to be cozying up, as it were, to the Soviet Union. Uh, anyway, uh, all of this will trouble Washington, although they're not really quite sure what to do with it. Uh, in terms of U.S. policy in Latin America with the Cold War, uh, you'll see it change with the passage of time. This point in time, we're really in the early 60s. And this is a moment when John F. Kennedy has become President of the United States. Uh, Kennedy is, of course, uh, stridently anti-communist and so on. We're in the midst of the Cold War. But Kennedy and his policymakers, in terms of Latin America, come to view communism in this region, maybe in a different sort of, uh, of a light. Uh, among other things, there's a real concern apart on the part of policymakers in the U.S. during this period of time uh, that economic troubles and social troubles in different parts of Latin America are creating an environment where communism could take root and grow, as it were. And so, among other things, you are going to really see during this era an attempt by the United States to pour money into the region, uh, trying to solve economic and social problems uh, in order to, again, prevent the spread of communism. Uh, in terms of this, you see this early on in all sorts of ways, the speeches of the day uh, and so on. Uh, Kennedy, in his inaugural address, this is January of 1961, actually speaks to Latin America. Uh, he uh, says, among other things, to our sister republic south of our border, we offer a special pledge to convert our good words into good deeds in a new alliance for progress, uh, to assist freedom and free governments in casting off the chains of poverty. But this peaceful revolution of hope cannot become the prey of hostile powers. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas and let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master uh, of its own house. Uh, among other things here, 
Kennedy refers to an alliance for progress. Uh, this is in an inaugural speech. What this means will begin to be hammered out in the months that follow Kennedy's inauguration. And ultimately, the Alliance for Progress will be patterned on actually a, a proposal that had been made by Brazil's previous president. We just talked about him, Juscelino Kubitschek, who imagined what he called Operation Pan America. Uh, and it was essentially the United States pouring money into Latin America uh, on the scale and modeled after the Marshall Plan uh, that really uh, helped bring Europe back into life, as it were, in the wake of World War II. And so, uh, anyway, Kennedy's policymakers, his advisors, and so on, begin to operationalize this idea of uh, an Operation Pan-America. They don't call it what uh, Kubitschek wanted to call it. They call it the Alliance for Progress. And again, you see allusions to this in Kennedy's inaugural address. Brazil was considered to be the linchpin of this alliance for progress. Uh, it's big, it's powerful, it's got a developing economy. The United States uh, very much envisioned Brazil as kind of central to this sort of a policy. Uh, in the midst of this idea on the part of the United States, Janio Quadros is pursuing an independent foreign policy, cozying up to the Soviet Union, uh, awarding Che Guevara, uh, as it were, uh, the, the, the Order of the Southern Cross, all of this really is a, a point of worry and concern on the part uh, of U.S. policymakers. Uh, ultimately, Quadros will resign from office precipitously on August the 24th, 1961. It was weeks, or, or I shouldn't say weeks, but just shortly after actually giving Che Guevara, this Order of the Southern Cross. Uh, why does he resign? Again, it's precipitous. Nobody's expecting this. Uh, some said that he had been threatened by the United States or foreign uh, interests. And again, his resignation came shortly after awarding uh, che, che Guevara the Order of the Southern Cross. Uh, the Soviet press, for example, Pravda writes on August the 27th, 1961, that, it was, that his resignation was caused by, quote, pressure from imperialist circles in the USA. Uh, this is one idea. Uh, that being said, the United States is also very much wondering what is going on in Brazil. Why did Quadros resign? Uh, in a confidential memorandum uh, to the President of the United States, uh, for example, the director of the CIA speculated about what Quadros was doing. Uh, here we get the CIA trying to figure that out. They write, Quadros has manifest tendencies to draw closer to the bloc, that is to say the, the Soviets and, and, and the Eastern Bloc, uh, have aroused strong expressions of disapproval from the army and from conservative elements in Brazil. We think it likely that he resigned in the expectation of provoking a strong manifestation of popular support, uh, in response to which he would return to office in a better position against his opponents. Uh, and then they note, Fidel Castro resigned once for this purpose, and Perón, Perón was the president of Argentina, Perón more than once. Uh, anyway, what's going on here? Why did Quadros resign? Uh, ultimately, the only person who really knows the answer to this question is Janio Quadros. Uh, this all being said, if Quadros was gambling that he would be given greater powers if he agreed to stay on. Uh, his gambit was a complete failure. Uh, the Brazilian Congress quickly accepted his resignation, really without any debate. Uh, the President of Congress really simply announced, quote, I received this letter from the President, and he has resigned. He resigned. It's a personal decision, unilateral in nature, and we're not going to discuss it further. Uh, he's gone. Quadros thereafter would fly to Sao Paulo, where witnesses said he was drinking heavily. He got actually into a fist fight with the governor of Sao Paulo. Uh, from there, he went to the port of Santos uh, on the coast of Sao Paulo, where he boarded an outbound ship and amidst sobs, blamed his political demise on, quote, occult forces. Uh, I was compelled to resign, he declared. But like Getulio, I shall return one day, God willing, to show everyone who were the scum uh, in this country. Uh, in fact, he will actually win re-election again, uh, not to be president, 
but he does win re-election to be the mayor of Sao Paulo in 1985, a position he'd heard, held early in his career. He actually defeats uh, Fernando Henrique Cardozo in 85 to be the mayor of Sao Paulo. Uh, Fernando Henrique Cardozo will talk about later in class as a future president of Brazil uh, in the 1990s. Uh, but anyway, Quadros's resignation was accepted. He would never return to the Brazilian presidency. The only question that really remained at this point in time, who was going to be his legal successor? Uh, legally, I should point out, his mantle, of course, fell on the vice president of Brazil, João Goulart, a Jango of the PTB, the Workers' Party. Uh, at the moment, however, Goulart was not in Brazil. Uh, he was visiting Red China on a goodwill mission. Uh, for many elements in the Brazilian military, uh, as well as elements in the United States, Goulart's whereabouts cast a very long shadow on the future of Brazil. Uh, and this really is where we'll pick up next time. Uh, but before we do that, let me show you some images uh, that speak uh, to uh, the stories that I've been telling you. All right, I just want to show you some images that speak to some of what we've talked about here. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the wake of Getulio Vargas' suicide, you have various individuals jockeying for power, uh, running for office. And of course, Juscelino Kubitschek is going to win that election. Juan Goulart will win the vice presidency. But in terms of some of the other characters running, uh, here on our left, you can see uh, Juarez Tavara, as well as on the right, Eduardo Gomez. Uh, Tavaro was a former Tenanchi from the Tenanchi movement of the 1920s, and he ran as a presidential candidate for the UDN, the Democratic National Union, a traditional opposition party, Getulio Vargas. Uh, he runs for the 1955 election uh, to uh, you know, take over in the wake of Vargas' suicide. Uh, beyond that, you have the return of integralism, as it, well, as it were. Not really integralism per se, but certainly former integralists. Uh, Plinio Salgado uh, that is shown here, and uh, he's shown here on the left, you can see him here. Plinio Salgado will return uh, to run for the Brazilian presidency. Uh, vice presidency, we're going to have uh, João Goulart. Uh, he was the former heir apparent, as it were, of Vargas. Here he's shown it at the wake, at the Vargas's funeral. Uh, he runs basically on a cross-party ticket as the vice presidential candidate of the PTB, which is supporting the PSD candidate, and this is, of course, Juscelino Kubitschek, uh, who goes on to win the presidency. And so here you can see Kubitschek again of the PSD. Uh, I showed you this image before. It's these two characters, Kubitschek and uh, Golart. And in the background again, uh, here in the background, we see uh, Vargas, as it were. Uh, he's gone, uh, but again, not uh, not really. Well, anyway, the election is held. They win the election. There are all sorts of machinations thereafter. Uh, these machinations, in part, conspiracies and so forth, are set off by uh, a lot in terms of uh, rallies and so forth in the wake, and be both before and after the election. Uh, here you're, you're seeing, among other things, a rally for Kubitschek and Gallart in 1955. Among other things, if you look here, you can see a reference here, the USSR to communism, uh, to the PCB. They want the legality of the PCB. What is the PCB? It is the Brazilian Communist uh, Party. And so you can see here that uh, Golart and Kubitschek are drawing on a broad range uh, of, of support, uh, including communists. And what you're going to end up with is a rightist backlash against the left that will eventually call for a military coup to uh, keep Kubitschek and Golart from office. This will be precipitated when João Café Filho, Vargas's vice president, who's acting as president during the 1955 elections, has a heart attack. And here you can see uh, in bed, João Café Filho, he has had his uh, heart attack. This really is gonna set off a moment of crisis. Uh, the man who assumes the presidency uh, in the midst of the, uh, the heart attack is a member of the UDN who wants to prevent Kubitschek and Goulart uh, from coming uh, to power. But anyway, here you can see João Cafilio in bed. This is another image here. Uh, he's shown in the bottom right. Uh, he is, uh, he's recovering at a clinic from his uh, heart attack and so on. Uh, this is the individual 
member of the military, uh, the war minister eventually of Kubitschek, but at this point in time, just a general, and Hiki Lot, uh, who is going to ensure that Kubitschek and Gallart will be allowed to take office. Uh, he was highly respected. He was considered nonpartisan. Uh, eventually, again, he's actually going to serve uh, in Kubitschek's administration as his minister of war. But anyway, just gives you a sense of the machinations, the conspiracies, all in the wake of uh, really Vargas's suicide. Again, Kubitschek is known for many things, among others, the construction of Brasilia. Uh, again, his motto was 50 years in five. He wants to really change Brazil, develop it in all sorts of ways. And really the, the, the exemplification of this is in the construction of a new capital 600 miles into the interior on a high plateau where nothing existed uh, really up to this point in time. Uh, and here you can see what this looked like. Again, uh, it was called the Plano Piloto. It was designed to look from the air like an airplane. And if you uh, look at this image here, you're going to get a sense of this. Uh, here you can see this is our fus fuselage. Uh, here are our wings. This is the uh, the south wing and this is the north wing. Azanor, Chi, Azazul. And uh, this is the front part of the plane where you're going to have the pilot and, uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, everything is built uh, with the idea of newness and modernity. Uh, in terms of that newness and modernity, uh, here you can see a lake that is going to be designed. This is a completely artificial lake that uh, is brought in uh, to this area. So anyway, everything is changed as it were. Here is the Plano Piloto. Uh, again, the Plano Piloto was in no small part uh, based on a, a contest. Who's going to win this thing? And the man who wins the, 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 the opportunity to design the new city uh, and so on uh, is a, a character named Lucio Costa. And uh, he and Oscar Niemeyer are going to do a lot of the work to construct this. And here you can see uh, all these characters gathered around with uh, Juscelino Kubitschek uh, in order to build uh, this place. Uh, but And uh, here's another image here you can see of uh, Oscar uh, Nehemiah, who is uh, the architect who's doing much of the construction of Brasilia. Uh, image here of Kubitschek and his wife. Uh, this is in the midst of the construction, and they are in front of their house. You can see it says, this house uh, is part of the first construction in Brasilia. Uh, this is going to be actually where... Uh, the president of the republic lives while the place is as it were being constructed. The truth is he stays a lot of his time in Rio, but he'll come to visit Brasilia as it's being built. Uh, in the background here, you can see one of the workers uh, who is uh, who's actually smoking. Uh, here you can see the construction of the Brazilian Congress, uh, and uh, it's an interesting uh, sort of thing. Here's the construction of the National Cathedral. I'll show you a later image of what that looks like in more contemporary times. Uh, in a moment, you can see government ministries uh, going off in the background there. This is an example of one of these satellite cities that I referred to. Essentially, they're squatter settlements. Workers come uh, in large part from poor areas of Brazil, especially from the Northeast, and they're coming for work. They're coming to build Brasilia. Where are they going to live? The city is not built for workers. It's built for government bureaucrats uh, from Rio to come live in. Uh, you end up with these squatter settlements. Uh, satellite cities is what they'll eventually be called. Uh, and they're called satellites because, of course, they go around uh, the Plano uh, Piloto that I referred to. Uh, but anyway, here you're looking at one of these satellite cities. This is uh, uh, a city built near Brasilia to house workers who build it. Uh, the city at this point in time you're looking at was called Freetown, Cidade Livre. Uh, eventually, it's going to be called the Nucleo Bandeirante. Brasilia, yeah. uh, as it looks today, relatively contemporary. This is actually probably 20 years old or so, this image that I'm showing you here. But what you're looking at here is Azazul, the southern wing, and it's just going off into the distance. You can see it going off into the distance with all of these buildings and so on. Uh, here is the Central Bank uh, of Brazil. It's showing on the left. Uh, this is a monument that you can find in the center part of Brasilia today. Uh, it's a monument celebrating those who built the city uh, and those who live in it. And it's referred to as Os Candangos. 
uh, and it was put together by a Brazilian uh, artist, a sculptor and a painter uh, from Sao Paulo, uh, but of Italian descent, who uh, built this thing. Uh, the unskilled workers who came to build Brazilia in the late 1950s were called Candangos, uh, and again, the sculpture was done in 1960 to honor them. Uh, and uh, today, anybody who is born in Brasilia actually is referred to as a candango. Uh, this was one of those images we saw earlier of uh, the Congress. This is the Brazilian Congress as it looks today. And you can see here on our left, this is underneath here is the chamber where the Senate meets. And over here on our right, underneath this, is the uh, chamber uh, where where the, the, the house meets. Uh, again, the Senate is on the left looking down, uh, whereas the Chamber of Deputies uh, on the right, uh, they're looking up. The notion here is the Chamber of Deputies are supposed to be more open to new ideas uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Brazil is, of course, built by Juscelino Kubitschek. This is really his idea. And uh, today, you go vis visit Brasilia. This is a monument. You can see it here. The whole thing really is the monument. But uh, up top here, you can see a sculpture. This sculpture depicts Juscelino Kubitschek. Uh, just some other images. This is Brasilia today. Uh, looking in the background here, this is called the Conjunto Nacional. It's a, a shopping mall. Uh, underneath it, you can see this underneath part down here, is a rodoviária, uh, a bus terminal, uh, essentially, for, uh, for, for, for Brasilia. I uh, showed you the National Cathedral being built. Uh, here is a more contemporary image of Brazil's National Cathedral. Again, you get a sense of this modernism uh, and so on. This is actually an image of the National Cathedral that I took in Brazil when I was in Brasilia living in 1992. And what do you see in here? I don't know if you can make this out, but uh, that is a little Fusca. This is a little uh, 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 bug, uh, a Volkswagen bug. These are all crates. This is a shanty town, And essentially people, uh, squatters, had moved into the parking lot uh, outside of the National Cathedral. I don't know that you're gonna find that today, but that's what it looked like when I visited the place uh, in 1992. So anyway, Brasilia, modern city, a city that nonetheless deals and continues to deal uh, with problems. Uh, in terms of problems, incidentally, this is a very, very expensive part of Brazil uh, to live in. The cost of living is much, much higher in Brasilia than the, the surrounding interior parts of Brazil, uh, much more akin to the cost of living, probably even more so than a, than a Sao Paulo or a Rio de Janeiro. So anyway, Brasilia, this is Kubitschek's dream. Uh, it goes up in the middle of nowhere uh, in the 1960s. Modernist city, uh, roads go over and under each other. There's going to be no stoplights. Everything's organized. All the churches in one place, the banks in another, the supermarkets in another. Um, it's a real, it's a real interesting place. Uh, anyway, Kubitschek will be succeeded by uh, Janio Quadros. And here you can see in the middle, Janio Quadros, this is uh, at his inauguration. Uh, on our right here is Juscelino Kubitschek, who is leaving the, the, the presidency behind. And on our left here is João Goulart, Jean Goulart, as he was often referred to, who served first as the vice president over here for uh, Kubitschek, and now has been elected to serve as the vice president during the presidency of Janio Quadros. Again, uh, he and Quadros are not members of the same party. They did not run on a, a ticket, uh, as was the case with Kubitschek uh, and Golart. Rather, it's just two separate elections, and Golart happened to win at the same time that Quadros uh, won. Uh, and here's another image of uh, the two at the inauguration. You can see them walking uh, side by side, happy as it were. They've won uh, each of their offices. The reality is they don't necessarily get along. Uh, at all. Uh, this was that other image that I showed you of Janio Quadros from earlier. Again, you got the thick rimmed glasses, the mustache. Uh, take a look at this one here, another one that I showed from before as well. Uh, this is a really interesting image. Uh, among other things, you're going to have the governor of Sao Paulo sitting right here. And this is the governor of the state of Guanabara at this point in time during uh, Quadros's presidency. Who is that? I don't know if he looks familiar to you at all. Guanabara is essentially what is today the state of Rio de Janeiro. 
and uh, the governor was Carlos Lacerda, and you can see him looking on at uh, Janio Quadros. Uh, they both, uh, you, you recall, Quadros won with the support of the UDN, but uh, his ideas, particularly in terms of foreign policy, were not things that uh, Carlos Lacerda particularly liked at all. Carlos Lacerda, by this point of time, is a staunch, staunch anti-communist uh, and very concerned about communist inroads in the region. Uh, Quadros' independent foreign policy is something that bothered him immensely. And anyway, you can see him uh, looking on. He looks uh, concerned. Uh, another image here, Quadros giving the... the uh, the Order of the Southern Cross, Cross to Che Guevara. Uh, again, it was shortly after this moment that Quadros will suddenly, uh, precipitously, uh, resign the Brazilian uh, presidency. But, uh, anyway, here's another image here. Again, I, I referred to Charlie Chaplin, I think. Uh, the, it looks a little like Charlie Chaplin. It strikes me at times. Uh, overconfident in all sorts of ways, an abundance of charisma, and you can see him speaking here. Uh, this all being said, he will precipitously uh, resign, as we talked about uh, before. And this is an image that was taken shortly as after his resignation, an image taken in August of 1961 uh, by a newspaper reporter. And this is an image that uh, would later win a prize. Uh, it shows Quadros shortly after his resignation. And the byline reads, Where are you going, Janio Quadros? And uh, you look at this, it graphically il illustrates really some of the central questions surrounding Quadros' resignation. What in the world was he doing? Was he simply tired of government? Uh, did he hope to create a crisis in order to get additional powers? Uh, did he even know why he did what he did and where he intended to take Brazil? Uh, who knows? But again, the byline reads, where are you going, Janio Quadros? And this photograph actually won a prize uh, the following year. A uh, few more images in terms of all of this. Uh, image of Quadros. Uh, again, this was shortly after his resignation. This was an image that was taken on August the 26th, 1961. The byline on this read, I am no longer president. And he actually looks kind of happy there. You can see his uh, wife uh, in the background right here. And this is his mother. And uh, she especially looks uh, pleasant in all of this. Who does the mantle of the presidency fall upon with his resignation? Uh, in class uh, next time, the presidency of João Goulart. Well, uh, you've been very kind to make your way through this video. Uh, I'm excited that you uh, were able to get uh, this information. I'm excited to take my daughter to help her figure out uh, where in the world she is going to college. Uh, so anyway. With that in mind, I believe it is time to let you go, uh, but I hope uh, you've enjoyed yourselves. Uh, -da 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 -da. Do you guys even know who I'm imitating here as I sing these silly songs? -da 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 -da. I ought to give extra credit uh, for anybody who can uh, figure out what I'm playing off of. I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So, anyway, I will see you uh, later. Uh, greetings from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Bye-bye.